What is this right here? Is it some sort of tree stump? No, my friends, it is the final phase of our starter base. And like the other buildings around here, it will have the sandstone and nether woods palette. But over here, you can see, of course, we've included some of the wooden textures down the bottom. And over here, I'm really going to go ham with that. So that's why there's just a ton of wood. And I was just thinking it almost looks like the beginnings of some giant tree. So I've been busy running back and forth between my base and somehow didn't notice this. Just noticed it a second ago. I've been so oblivious just plugging away at this project. This is uh, one of Scar's factories, I believe. And so I had the opportunity to talk to Scar and suss out the border between our two areas. He mentioned this idea of having his tree roots go down into the edges of the wastelands, which just makes for such an amazing border. And so things around the wastelands are really coming together, but I need to crack on with the building over here. And the way I'd like to do this is with some brief and snappy build updates. So you can see here, most of the foundation is done. We're now going to be focusing on the shell on top. But gotta say, Scar's build over here is so gorgeous. <laughs> I feel like I'm working in his shadow. However, there's quite a nice synergy with these like yellow materials in the background contrasting against the brown and green. And I realized that a moment ago, I didn't actually fill in the floors of those basin areas and they're now looking a little more interesting. I will of course spruce them up with more details later on, but now we're focusing on the main structure. You can see the tower is starting to expand up the top here, so it's going to be a top heavy build. The problem now is that I've run out of sandstone. So I need to pack up all of this and head out to the desert. And as it goes, it turned out I needed very little more of the sandstone, but I used up all of my raw gold blocks. You can see that on the top there. And on this side, it's honey blocks that fill in the gap. But the key thing here is that we've added some lights around the outside and more importantly, the little support struts down below made out of birch wood that hold up the top heavy feel. And so as you might suspect, all that's left to do is to build the roof out of the warped wood. And uh, once again, my friends, I've, I've scraped my supplies down to the very last bit. So much warped wood. So much warped wood. Oh, goodness me. But together, we can place the very last bits right here in the center. On top of this, we're going to have a prismarine wall. This is uh, always a little tricky to place because then I want to be on top of it after, right? So then we got warped vents and then we got iron bars. Woo, I'm a long way up here. Look at that right there. I look practically majestic. And so does this roof. Look at the design here. It's really fantastical. And it was a real challenge for me. Obviously, we've got like some elements that you've seen before, but I tried to incorporate some new ideas, especially on this side where we got some more of that strip wood and we got fence posts. Uh, and the way it comes together, it does look a little bit strange. But all of this style here is very fantastical, so I think it suits looking a little odd. And I've just been taking a moment here to enjoy the view of all that's going on around here and uh, kind of noticed that something else <laughs> is going on. And before we get distracted, let's have one jump off, look over our shoulder. Wow. I'm really, really stoked with how that turned out, actually. So I did notice that some of these uh, deep slate diamond pillars were popping up and I thought, you know, I might get in on that action. I have absolutely no idea what the story behind all of this is, but I really enjoyed mining for diamonds earlier on this season down at the bottom of the world. And after all of that building, yeah, I feel like I just want to go underground and do some digging. And before we get going here, let me just remark and say that our starter area is done. I'll probably spend some time on live streams making the wastelands look a little more interesting. But otherwise, these are the builds that I wanted to put together to have a little bit of a connected base area. Oh, and I guess the inside of this is going to be dark now, isn't it? Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. I might have make a, made a little mob spawner up here. Oh, I can hear some moaning and groaning. There's a zombie about. And there doesn't appear to be a single other mob. Okay, we are all lit up in here and good to go, because of course something's going to go in this building, right? But we'll come back to that later on. So you got to spend diamonds to make diamonds, and we're going to need ourselves some speed potions again. And yes, I do have a beacon, 
And I could move it down to the bottom of the world and, you know, use the speed effect. That might actually be a good idea. Although the beacon has a limited range, but it is pretty far in each direction. Look, I'm going to churn through these speed potions first of all. Maybe we'll move this thing underground later. And before I get going, I actually already have 17 Diamond Deep Slate from last time. I ain't going to put these out front just yet because it's going to look pretty pathetic until we get like at least a stack of this stuff. So once again, I set off to the bottom of the world where I like to do my mole mining technique, which is a lot of fun. And in about 40, 45 minutes, I've accumulated all of this. So we're kind of averaging like a deep slate diamond ore every minute. And while I was using the replay mod to create that time lapse, uh, I noticed that my <laughs> mole mining here just sort of goes on and on and on. And then also some different mining strategies, including vertical poke holes, which is not the worst idea ever. In fact, it's a pretty smart way to look for diamonds. And with that catching my eye, I had a little bit of a look around and noticed that there are lots of different mining techniques based on where in the world you go and explore. And I'm kind of curious to know is how these worked out for each of the hermits that tried them. So a couple of hours later on and I have amassed over a stack of diamond deep slate ore using the beacon that you can see behind me. But the real question here is where exactly is this beacon located? It is in a very special place, my friends, for this glorious landscape you see right here is my own. You are looking at the future location of my Minecraft base here on this season of Hermitcraft. And my concept is that there's going to be a grand and unique entrance at the front here, and then everything else is actually going to be hidden underground inside the mountain. So for that reason, I figured if I'm going to put a beacon in a new location that hasn't been mined, then where my base is going to be would be a great spot. And so down here at the bottom of the world, in the negative region, full of the deep slate, you can see that there is a, uh, a square shape here. This is me mole mining in the radius of the beacon's speed effect. So we pretty much hit up all of the diamonds to be found down at the bottom in this space right here. And so we're going to be coming back here a lot in the very near future, so it would be wise to set up a nether portal. And I wanted to demonstrate how close I was to the main Hermitcraft area, but here in the nether it, it kind of makes you feel like you're quite far away. Yeah, the other side of this portal, and then over there, just around there, that's where my regular portal is. And so here if we take a look at the world map, this is the communal area, the shopping donut entrance over here on the left, and then... Where I'm going to be settled is just up here. This mountain range right here, that's what you just saw a moment ago. So yeah, it's just a couple of rockets, a flight over the mountain, and we're at the place where our base will be in the future. But for now, I've got just under two stacks of deep slate diamond ore. And here's something smart that I can do. I can pick, you know, a bit of terrain that's slightly more elevated than anything else around it. And that's it. For the price of several hours of my time, we have joined into uh, a very silly game. And it doesn't look like I've even got half as much. Have these grown? I think these might have grown since we last checked them out. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This was the third pillar. Ah, oh, Doc M and his World Eater. There is no way we're going to be able to compete with Doc. And, uh, you know, my pillar looks pretty wimpy. Look, whenever I feel like going mining, I'll do some more and hopefully we can add to it as the season goes on. And speaking of the season, if I've made it clear or not, I've tried to take a different approach. Play the game very casually, try and capture the spirit of the past, and I've learned something rather important. Things tend to move rather slow and you tend to make a lot of mistakes if you don't do all the planning and preparation beforehand. You see, a lot of how I played the game in the past seasons, the recent ones, there's just everything planned out beforehand. And this time it's been much more spontaneous, which has been certainly fun, but it's also been difficult on occasion too. So, for example, our uh, kelp farm project down here was also going to hook up with a sugarcane farm and a bamboo farm. And because I didn't plan all the way ahead and built these things spontaneously, I've kind of realized that 
The bamboo farm has a low ceiling here that we can't really change because of the wastelands above. And if it's not obvious why that's a problem, it's because bamboo grows taller. So if you have a low ceiling, you have a less efficient farm. Also, bamboo growth might be related to light. You can see here in the center of this area, where it's its darkest, the bamboo is yet to start growing. But that's the cool thing about doing things spontaneously as well, is that you learn a bunch of stuff along the way. Now this bamboo farm is yet to get a collection system. That's something that I'm probably going to do on a live stream. Whenever I have to do something like long and grindy and repetitive, that is the place I tend to do these things. So make sure that you follow me over on Twitch if you want to catch any of the live streams. For now, I have to manually run around and collect this stuff, which is absolutely fine. And I'm hoping that this is going to be enough bamboo for our next two projects, which are really important. They're sort of like the last two before we really get into the weeds of our base for this season. And when we start to work on the base, I think I'm going to have to shift gears and do a lot more preparation. So the next two farms I wish to work on involve scaffolding. So we've got the bamboo taken care of, and the next thing that we need is the string. And if this seems like a moment of deja vu, well, that's because we were over here attempting to farm some string not too long ago. And judging on a lot of the comments that I got, I think many of you missed the point of the farm that I was attempting to and failing to build in this area. So I'll reiterate it again. I wanted to build a cave spider spawner that could kill all of the cave spiders with a sword like this one right here. However, the trick was to have the absolute minimal amount of effort. Oh my God, that's terrifying. Oh my God, that is absolutely terrifying. <laughs> and I know how that happened. Okay. When I'm editing my videos, I'm always amazed at how I can lose my train of thought before I finish explaining something. This time though, I can blame it on the creeper. And the point that I didn't quite get to finish is that I just wanted to make a farm that had a very minimal amount of effort, something that you could throw together in a short time with a small amount of materials. I'm now terrified that other mobs might have spawned inside of here, but check out this view right here. I've been killing tons of cave spiders. So a shout out to Gecko who came up with this wonderful farm design right here. When I was goofing around in the world, I couldn't figure anything out, but uh, they managed to do it and they made a tutorial on that. So it will be linked in the description box down below. If you want to know how to build a very quick and simple cave spider farm that you can use with a looting sword, then go and check it out. Now, I myself attempted the diagonal design, but I abandoned it because, well, sometimes the cave spawners spawn over here and they don't actually see the player. Well, using water to push them to the center is just brilliant. And in this corner over here, you can see that we've got some bushes because on occasion, they will for some reason not actually see the player and wander in this direction and then they get killed, meaning that more can spawn from the spawner and continue on to the player. Then over here we have this really cool collection area that just funnels all of the cave spiders every time to this single spot and all of their drops get caught by the water as well. They land on these hoppers or get pushed onto them by the water and everything collects here in the chest. And as you saw in the time lapse this thing works exceedingly well. All the cave spiders pretty much either end up in front of the player or they get killed so that more can spawn. The flaw that we've discovered is that the floor here allows other mobs to spawn. So I'll come back here another time and fix that up. For now though, we have our string to make more scaffolding and we've achieved it with a new farm design. This game's been around for a long time and a lot of people have figured out the best ways to do stuff and sometimes it's just nice to come on new designs and new ways of doing things. That was insane. <laughs> I guess a creeper wandered through here. And I guess also a cave spider got through here because I have been poisoned. That was that was so bizarre. And I'm kind of lucky this thing wasn't built sort of floating out above like a lava lake. I could have just dropped down to my death. 
And so I'm just going to mention again the tutorial by Gecko will be linked in the description box down below and uh, thank you for sharing it. I absolutely love the use of the water streams. Such a simple solution to make a great farm. And speaking of great farms, I guess there's going to be another one that gets linked in the description box because we're about to build a really amazing farm using scaffolding that has had me so interested ever since I first saw it. Finally, we're going to get around to building it. However, this farm is a long, long ways from home and it's the second time we're looking at this map in this video. So I'm just like sliding across all the way over over here. If it isn't clear, this is like thousands of thousands of blocks away and it's on this island here that Corallus has invited me to come over and build some farms with him. And I came here prepared with obsidian and flint and steel and I found a tunnel that went roughly to the same place and the reason that it went to the same place is because Corallus has already hooked us up with a portal. And it is directly on top of the pillager outpost, right? And the pillagers are going to be on this island causing me some problems. And so my basic line of defense against these uh, pillagers is literally just a wall to keep them out of this area for now. And so once again, we don't have a total plan, but we're going to be building farms here where you AFK up in the sky. So we'll eventually take advantage of where the pillagers spawn over here. But on the opposite side of the island, that's where we're going to build a general purpose mob farm today with a really wonderful design that takes advantage of the properties of scaffolding. Which probably sounds a little overly dramatic, but believe me, you're going to love this. If you like mob farm mechanics, then this is just a wonderful, wonderful design. So a brief demonstration of one of scaffolding's properties is its ability to act like vertical redstone. So when we change the status of a trapdoor, you can see that further up where the scaffolding is, it'll update an observer. And that's because the scaffolding is changing its support value. There might be something you can see in F3, actually. Yeah, on the right hand side it says distance 1 and then that will change to distance 0 when it's supported at the bottom. So it's all the way up here that we're going to have a mob farm and some platforms for them to spawn. And of course we need to send a signal up and so we use the scaffolding to do that which has helped make building this thing really easy. So you put trapdoors around the side which I think could actually be any type of block. The idea being that it wouldn't stop creepers from spawning. And there's an idea we'll come back to in just a moment. But first of all, we're going to place scaffolding on each of these. And then from there, we're going to build out as far as we can go. So this is super quick to build, which I really like. And it's the perfect shape for the water to flow out from the center. And that will push off any mobs that have happened to spawn on top of the scaffolding. But it also has another unique property that mobs don't actually pathfind on the scaffolding, even though they can spawn in it. So they'll never fight the water currents that push them out to the very edge. And now that we've built our first floor, we pop on top of the scaffolding and simply repeat the process. And so each floor is going to be really quick to build. And if you want to be a bit sloppy and accidentally place too many scaffolds over the edge, it's not a problem. They're just going to go down onto the bottom and you can collect them later. And another really important part of this farm that's not to be overlooked is putting the scaffolding here. Of course, the observer enables it to send a signal upwards again, but it has another unique property. And this is best demonstrated by showing this old method where you had the water dispensed directly below where the observer would detect it. The problem here is that when it's dispensed like that, everything's good, but when it goes back, the flowing water will create lots of updates in the observer. You can see it's blinking multiple times, and then that just creates multiple problems on the floor above, which seem to have figured itself out this time. Let's just activate that again. And then when I close it, we should see that one or two of the floors might not actually get rid of the water. And so the difference with the design that we're building is that that scaffolding in the middle actually holds the water in as a waterlogged block. So when you send this upwards, it's never a problem with the previous design, but it stops the water from flowing back in to where the scaffolding is. So each time we go through this iteration, all of the floors will remove their water together. And I'd recently been goofing around in a test world with a scaffolding spider farm where spiders could spawn inside of here. And I found out that actually creepers are able to spawn in this space too. 
And I'm guessing the dealio here is that the collision box of the scaffolding is actually the very top part. So it's similar to having a trapdoor, meaning that a creeper can spawn inside of this space, but not a skeleton, for example. And so originally I set out to modify this farm and make it creeper only. Well, that would be creeper and spider. So if I put trapdoors down like this, we could achieve that. But, you know, then we're placing a lot of trapdoors and not really taking full advantage of the scaffolding's properties. And so if you wanted to get close to a system like this working, you couldn't have the dispensers facing upwards, as then you would require more space between each floor. So this is the closest you could get to having the dispensers flow the water over the scaffolding. But of course, the distance here is the problem. So the distance that the water travels means that around the edges you would need something like an open fence gate and placing a lot of those would be annoying. So alternatively you could have a couple of trapdoors coming out. And so if you wanted to modify this design as I originally did you could actually build it like this with a ton of trapdoors over the edge. And as you can see here the concept is sound with exception to the top floor we're only getting spiders and creepers spawning. And if we hit the trapdoor, this thing will also dispense the water pretty flawlessly too. Oh yeah, and the creepers can actually drift up through the floors, which is very strange. And you know what else looks pretty strange? This farm, when it's finished, because uh, it's got an absolutely mahoosive roof on top of it. Let's just drift down here to the pillager outpost, park my bum on the top of it, and uh, aha, there you go. It looks like a traditional farm, but we know that it's not, and notice how all the hitboxes of the mobs that have spawned in there aren't moving because they won't do that when they're on scaffolding. So before we actually activate this farm, which I can do by hitting the lever and then changing the status of this scaffold, sending a signal up, we want to remove all of this, of course, but we need to create a collection system for the drops. But with time being what it is, I'm first of all just going to shout out Ian XO4 again for another amazing farm design, which is what this thing right here is. It'll be linked in the description box down below. And we're not actually done constructing it. I'm going to take care of that in between episodes. So at the beginning of the next one, you can see this thing in action. And trust me, it's going to be wonderful. But that is the end of the episode. If you have enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like, check out those videos in the description box listed below, and I'll see you soon with another one. Bye-bye.